I'm Ellie Garrett, and this is my friend Ryan. So Ryan, what were your expectations of the Christian faith? My mom and my dad kind of have two different backgrounds, and so my dad believes one thing, and then of course my mom was the daughter of a pastor herself. So we ended up going like with my dad's denomination, and I didn't really get it. Because you know, you imagine like the, a God figure, and you're like, oh, this must be you know a very loving individual. And that wasn't really what they taught us, and they taught us that if you didn't belong to that denomination, you wouldn't get into heaven. So a lot of that just rubbed me, and, and especially my sister, who was more involved in the youth group, just really rubbed her the wrong way. And seeing her hurt that way, I didn't want that for her or for me. So one of your first impressions of Pathfinder was when me and you went to the Holy Week experience. It felt really cool to be able to like walk through and, and experience it in a new way, because I think it, it's one thing when you read about it, but it's another to kind of see everything and be like, oh my gosh, like this is what he went through. I thought it was like really powerful imagery, but even at that point, I, w I wasn't sold on it at all, but I think that was the, the little first step. And I think it's important to have a place like this where it's like, hey dude, like you're a fundamentally very flawed person. You were broken and gross, and there's somebody who loves you for that anyway. I, I feel like that's a much more vulnerable, a much more human experience. And I, I thought that was really neat, and there's just nothing else like that. So Ryan, was there ever a time when you felt like there was a specific turning point in your faith where you felt like there was a God worth pursuing for you? The summit retreat? I had attended like a little bit and still thought it was kind of weird. I was like, okay, John and Pua are awesome, but like, I don't, I don't want to spend a weekend with these people, you know? <laughs> we convinced you. We were like, yeah, you have we were like, to no, come. you have to go. <laughs> it ended up being really, really cool. Take a weekend off work and, and just go in the middle of nowhere and just talk to these people who, who all have the same beliefs. You mentioned that your sister had a bad experience with youth group and that sort of put you off to any association with a church or a faith. Is there anything else that made you sort of resistant to the Christian faith at all? Yeah, I was born with this like physical disability and prune belly syndrome, which sounds very made up. So I didn't have any, any muscles in here, right? Just didn't show up to work that day. And, <laughs> <laughs> and it didn't really affect my life too much. And it, it could have been way worse. Like other kids have it and, and they need like kidney transplants, nothing that serious. But um, I just felt different. Here's all the other kids who look like this and do all these things and here's you. And so I think that was part of it was just not having a real strong sense of community. And then of course getting to my sister when I was uh, 14, she uh, committed suicide. And and so all of the grief and the, the nihilism and existential dread that comes with that, you kind of ask yourself like what kind of a loving God could let things like this happen? And and this is touched on even in the Bible, which was really weirdly reassuring. You know, like the story of Job where like this man has everything taken from him and he's like, I love God anyway, I know I do. That's powerful stuff, that's really cool. So I think those were the initial roadblocks, but I think they're also the things that have, or will eventually make my faith even, even stronger. What has being part of this church community meant to you? It's really cool to, to meet so many people that have so much hope. And so many people are just slipping into this, well, nothing matters. Why do anything? And that's terrifying. That is a really scary place to be. And, and so to meet these people that are like, well, I, I'm not done. No, dude, like there's so much life to live while we're here. And then, you know, of course, a lot of them, and, and I'm not there yet, but they're like, I'm, there's something after this too. Like, and so I think that's just really cool is, is you just have all these people that haven't given up. Yeah, to be surrounded by people who believe in something that makes sense is really, really powerful. probably goes without saying, but I love all of the stories that uh, we have heard this weekend. Each of them speak to me personally and where I am uh, this year in a different way, but in a powerful way. Um, but, there, but there was something about that last story that kind of caught me off guard. It was Tuesday of this last week, and I was watching a draft of all these stories getting ready for my part of the service. And I was watching um, that interview with Ryan, him just sharing his story, his journey. And 
there came that moment where he was talking about Job from the Old Testament, how Job was this guy who lost everything. He lost his property, his wealth, his family, his reputation, even his health. But Job was this guy who after all of this loss and the face of all of this loss was able to say, and I love how Ryan put it, I love God anyway. I know I do. And as I was sitting in my office watching these, uh, these videos on Tuesday, hearing Ryan say that, it was like someone struck oil in my soul, you know, black gold, Texas tea. There was like this geyser, this geyser of emotion that just kind of came out of nowhere. And I, w- I was just like sobbing in my office. And, and, and I'm still not sure exactly why. I'm not sure exactly what hit. I know something hit. I think part of it could be just Ryan's story. I've gotten to know Ryan a little bit over the last couple of years. And, and I love that guy. I love both um, the tenderness that his hardship has brought to him, but also the openness that he has. I love that although he's not sure about everything related to faith yet, he's still curious and he's open and, and he's so sincere and, and just his spirit, his, his kindness, his openness, it moves me and his story moves me. Uh, so I know that was a part of it, but I know for me also, um, as I heard that, and especially the part about Job and recounting Job's experience and Ryan putting it, you know, I love God anyway, I know I do in spite of all of this, I think that really hit home for me and my story because, I mean, 2020 has been a year, but, but October, man, this has been a month. You know what I'm saying? Like, whew, it's been a month. I, I won't get into detail, but there have been all kinds of things that my family has gone through over the last month. I'm um, just thing after thing after thing. And, and I don't know if we're being attacked by the evil one. I know certainly we're being attacked by some people, but I don't know if it's the evil one behind it. I don't know if we're being tested by God like Job was. I'm not really sure, but, but I think that reference to Job and, and Ryan of all people bringing that to light, it just, it just hit me and caused this release of all of this emotion. And I wanna be clear about something. <laughs> just before I say anything else, that I realize that although things have been hard for me, my family, maybe for you, that no one had it like Job did. No one had it that difficult. I mean, Job's situation was unthinkable. I, I want to show you exactly what I mean when I talk about Job and the loss that he experienced. This is from the book of Job. Uh, Job's life unfolded way, way back. I mean, this is really ancient. This is, this is probably before people like Abraham. Um, so this is very, very old History And so um, here's Job's story. One day when Job's sons and daughters were feasting and drinking wine at the oldest brother's house, a messenger came to Job and said, your oxen were plowing and the donkeys were grazing nearby. And the Sabaeans, these foreign invaders, they attacked and made off with them. They put the servants to the sword. They put them to death with the sword. And I'm the only one who has escaped to tell you. So this guy's there out of breath, you know, trauma. and, And he's telling Job about this. Well, while he was still speaking, that servant, another messenger came and said, the fire of God fell from the heavens and burned up the sheep and the servants, and I'm the only one who has escaped to tell you. And while he was still speaking, another messenger came and said, the Chaldeans, this other people group, they formed three raiding parties and they swept down on your camels and made off with them. They put the servants to the sword, and I am the only one who has escaped to tell you. So, so the oxen, the donkeys, the sheep, the camels, all of this guy's wealth, not to mention all of his servants, all of these people who worked for him, gone in an instant, but it gets worse. While that servant was still speaking, yet another messenger came and said, your sons and daughters are feasting and drinking wine at the oldest brother's house, when suddenly a mighty wind swept in from the desert and struck the four corners of the house. It collapsed on them, and they are all dead. And I am the only one who has escaped to tell you. And it was at this, I mean, all of this loss, not over the course of a year, not even over the course of a month, but in a matter of minutes, at this, Job got up, and he tore his robe, and he shaved his head, signs of of mourning, repentance. Uh, In the ancient world, when you felt bad, you, you let your physical condition reflect your inner condition. So he tore his robe, shaved his head. Then he fell to the ground, you know, face down, forehead to the ground in worship. 
And this is what he said, naked I came from my mother's womb and apparently naked I will depart. Everything's been taken away. The Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. This is the reality of my life right now, but blessed be the name of the Lord or may the name of the Lord be praised. In all of these things, Job did not sin by charging God with wrongdoing. So, so this guy, I mean, he's lost so much and his story is remarkable because he doesn't get angry with God. He doesn't blame God. He doesn't take issue with God. But this isn't even the end of it. See, a chapter later, then Job is afflicted with painful sores all over his body. He's in excruciating pain. So he, he not only loses everything, but he loses his health. And then for me, um, one of the worst parts is that his friends, three of his best friends, hear about his misfortune and they come to console him. And you think, man, okay, nothing like the embrace of friends when you're going through a really hard time. And so his friends come, best friends, and, and they gather around him in his deep pain and, and they begin to try to console him, but things take a very weird turn because as they start to console him and Job speaks back, it turns from consoling him to they start trying to correct him and they end up blaming Job for everything he's going through. They tell him that everything he has experienced, it's his fault. They say, you know, I mean, no one has luck this bad. Clearly you must have upset God. You've done something wrong. Job, you need to repent. And the reality was Job didn't do anything wrong, but these friends who came to console him, who, who were supposed to be this healing balm for his soul, they ended up being accusers. They ended up adding insult to injury. And the rest of the book is this back and forth between him and his friends, his friends saying some really hurtful things to him. And I look at Job's story and I think, yeah, that, that's it, right? People, people, this is what people do. People, they can be the greatest source of joy and comfort, but they can also be the greatest source of pain in our lives. Around here, we say life change happens in the context of relationships. I've been saying this for over a decade. This is a part of our 1-1-15-6 framework, be someone to another person in an intentional relationship. Life change happens in the context of relationships, and I believe this is true. And it's amazing to see how, in all of our stories today, this truth plays out, doesn't it? That these are not just stories of individuals who experience life change or growth or miraculous things, but at the heart of each of these stories, there is a community of people. There, there is a group of people who, who were core, who were essential to the story. Life change happens in the context of relationships. I believe that. But the problem is, in this present moment, in 2020, we are quitting on people, I, we're quitting on relationships like never before. I mean, for starters, there's the pandemic. And the pandemic means that, that we have to change the way that we connect with each other. And I'm grateful for technology, but nothing's the same of connecting, uh, the same as connecting with people flesh and blood, right? And so suddenly there is uh, you no know, gatherings for a lot of us for a long time, no church, still for a lot of us, at home right now, there's still no church. Like you can't do it, you can't risk it. There's no family dinners, there are no in-person birthday parties. And you know what, it is really hard to be the body of Christ, that's who we are called. We are called the physical, we are said to be the physical manifestation of Jesus on the earth. It is really hard to be the body of Christ while being socially distanced. And so the pandemic's created all these logistical challenges for our, our relationships, these relationships that are the context for life change. But that's not it. Beyond the logistics, this year has been controversy after controversy, um, you know, contentious issue after contentious issue, disagreement after disagreement, and, and we have begun turning against each other like never before. And we're all experiencing loss and we're all hurting, but instead of consoling each other, instead of coming around and, and loving each other, it's like Job's friends, we gather around and then we turn on each other and we start attacking each other. And so members of the same family don't talk to each other anymore because they can't agree on, on politics or they can't agree on their mask theology. Right? We have the deeply held beliefs about these things 
And, and so that's driving a wedge in families and, and friend groups and small groups, life groups who've been together for years. Suddenly they're splitting apart and churches are being torn apart and our communities are being torn apart. Our country is being torn apart. I can just say, personally speaking, I have never, and this is not an exaggeration, I know I'm prone to a little drama sometimes, but this is not an exaggeration. I've never wanted to leave ministry more than I do this year. Because it's the people stuff that just gets to be exhausting. You know, I'm, I'm frankly tired of the gossip. I'm tired of being stabbed in the back. I'm tired of of being misunderstood. I'm tired of people putting the worst construction on everything when the Bible tells us to put the best construction on everything. I'm tired of taking the high road when so many others are content to take the low road. I'm tired of consoling and comforting people when I'm the one who's in need of consolation and comfort and it seems like few people are around to do that. And, and so now my dream job, my dream job is, is this, I, I'm dreaming of a, of, a, of a nice office with a window overlooking something beautiful in nature and not a person around for miles, but lots of spreadsheets. I'm just like, yes, spreadsheets. I mean, that's, you know, what's bad, right? When spreadsheets sound like heaven to you, but, and here's what I know. I know it's alarming and it's probably a little uncomfortable to hear me saying this. And my goal is not to complain because here's what I believe. I believe that a lot of us, a lot of you have, have felt those same ways. You've said those exact same things some point, at some point this year, haven't you? I mean, my words could be yours, couldn't they? And so really there, there is no wonder that we're quitting on each other, we're quitting on relationships because we're already overwhelmed and, and we just say, well, man, who, who would put up with this? It's madness. And doesn't Job's story prove it out that you know, life is bad and then your friends come in and it makes it worse? I mean, who needs enemies when you got friends like this? But before we give way to cynicism and hopelessness, I wanna remind us of two things today. I want us to remember two things today. The first thing is something we talk about so often. Every hard thing, every hard thing is an opportunity to grow. And I believe that not just as a platitude, as some you know, nice sentiment, I believe it because that's what the word of God says. Romans chapter five, Paul says, we also glory in our sufferings. Why? Because we know that suffering produces. Just look at those words. Suffering produces. Suffering is not pointless, not when God is involved. Even our sufferings, they produce good things. So suffering produces things like perseverance and character and hope. And of course, hope doesn't disappoint us or put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through his Holy Spirit who has been given to us. Or in Romans chapter 8, Paul says this, a few chapters later, same book. It says, who shall separate us then from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword, like all this bad stuff? You know, as it's written, for your sake, we face death all day long. We're considered like sheep who are ready to be slaughtered. We're sitting ducks here. And then he says, no, 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 wait a minute. In all of these things, in the danger and famine and sword and nakedness and all of these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. See, Paul's saying, not only does God help us get through those things, but those are the very things that form us, that change us from being ordinary people to being overcomers. Through those things and the love of God that carries us through, we become conquerors. See, every hard thing is an opportunity to grow. And you can look at 2020 as a disaster, which it is, Or you can also look at 2020 through the eyes of faith, through the lens of the spirit, the wisdom of the spirit, and say, man, 2020 is a year where God has given us lots of opportunities to grow, which he is. Every hard thing is an opportunity to grow. Here's the other thing I want you to remember, and this is so important. When we quit on each other, we're quitting on growth. 
See, there comes that moment when you're overwhelmed where you say, forget it, and you throw up your hands and you say, I'm done. You might, you might give up hope or you walk away from your relationships. You quit on people in your life. That's a natural thing to happen. But, but before the overwhelmed feeling and the decision to walk away, there is a critical decision point. And I'll tell you, the people who grow make one decision and the people who don't grow, the people who are crushed, they make a different decision. Actually, they are two decisions. The first decision that people who grow in that moment of being overwhelmed, the, the decision they make, the first decision they make is they choose to believe the promises of God even when they can't see any evidence of them. And today I just want to remind you of a couple things and I want to ask you, in spite of anything hard that you're going through, any difficulty that you're going through, do you still trust that God always provides? Do you trust that the Holy Spirit still works miracles today? You can say, man, we, we, are, we are out of luck in our country or in our world, but hey, do you believe that God is a God who still works miracles just like we heard today? Even in spite of everything that we've experienced together, can you still trust that Jesus really knows what it's like to live in your shoes? That he understands, he hasn't preserved himself safely away in heaven, but he came down in flesh. He, he, he is someone who can sympathize, empathize with our every weakness. He's been there, he's walked in our place. Can you trust that God's grace for you is the constant, the only thing that will fill your soul and that his mercies are new every morning and it doesn't matter what yesterday was and it doesn't matter how empty your tank is. Every day you wake up and God has grace to fill you with and that's the difference maker. Can you trust that? Can you trust that suffering and loss, while it may be due to your disobedience, and, and we can't ever say for sure, maybe it is, maybe it isn't, and while we don't know, can you still trust that while it may be to your diso uh, because of your disobedience, can you trust that suffering and loss are always for your growth? See, it doesn't matter if you're suffering and you're experiencing loss because you messed up or you're suffering and you're experiencing loss through no fault of your own, it doesn't matter because when you trust in God, when you believe his promises, it will always work out for your growth. Whether it's your fault or not, can you trust that Jesus never skips town? That the word of Hebrews 13, where God says, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. That means never, that means especially when life is scary. See, see, people who are overwhelmed and then grow through all of that are people who first choose to believe the promises of God even when they can't see any evidence of them in their lives. And so today, I wanna to encourage you to be these kinds of people. I want you to take a picture of this and, and maybe write some other promises of God down and, and put them before you and reread them and reread them and reread them again and put them on your bathroom mirror, put them on your phone lock screen. I don't know what you need to do, but remember the promises of God and remind yourselves of them and believe them, trust them, even when it doesn't seem like any of this is the reality. But there's a second choice that people make, people who are overwhelmed, that enables them to grow rather than to be crushed by suffering and hardship. And that's this. They choose to persevere in their relationships. See, again, that moment is really natural when you're overwhelmed where you just want to push away, you want to cocoon yourself, you just say, I'm done, I can't handle this anymore. But the people who grow are people who persevere in their relationships. That means you keep contending with that ornery family member. And that means you hang in with that life group or that, that community group, that circle of friends, even though every time you get together, it makes you uncomfortable. You persevere in the relationships. You choose not to let a divisive world divide you because that's all the evil one wants to do. You don't let a divisive world divide you from the people who matter most to you. And you persevere in those relationships because if life change happens in the context of relationships, then when we quit on each other, when we quit on our relationships, we're quitting on our growth. 
It doesn't happen any other way. And that's what the word of God says. See, the word of God says relationships are the thing that refines us. As iron sharpens iron, so one person sharpens another, says Proverbs. I I love this image because it describes what relationships can be like. They can be hard, they can be cold, sparks can fly, and yet that's how you get sharper. The word of God also says that spiritual growth is a group endeavor. It's not solo work. And yet, how often do we think of our spiritual growth as sitting in a room, reading a Bible, praying on my own, it's just me and Jesus? That's a part of it, but it's only a part of it. Look at what Paul says. He says, uh, let the message of Christ dwell among you in the community richly as you teach and admonish one another. Not just yourselves, but you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms, hymns, and songs of the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your heart. See, it's, it's not just solo work. You cannot grow completely on your own. You need a group of people. The word tells us that quitting on each other, it's only self-sabotage. I mean, we think about staying with our group for the good of the group and altruism and loyalty. The writer of the Hebrew says, let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess and let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the last day approaching. I don't know if the end times are coming, but I know Jesus says that in the last days, the love of many will grow cold. And I see our love growing cold, so this may be true, but look what this says. It says, the only shot we have to persevere ourselves, to hold on to hope, is through one another. Quitting on each other is self-sabotage. And then you go to the words of Jesus himself, where Jesus says that our family in Christ is our true Family, and I know I'm hitting close to home because for most of us, our blood, our DNA, we would, we would do anything for our blood, for our DNA. And yet Jesus says as important as those, as those bonds are, our true family is not blood family. It's not a DNA family. It is the family of those who've been washed in the blood, in the water of Jesus in baptism. That's our true family. Jesus one day, his natural family, his birth family came and they, they were calling to him. He was inside a house. He was teaching. People were like, hey, your, your mother and your brothers are here. And he replies, who is my mother and who are my brothers? Pointing to his disciples, he said, here are my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of my father in heaven is my brother and my sister and my mother. That, that's who our true family is. And, and then finally, again, the words of Jesus, he says, our unity is our testimony. Our unity is our witness. I mean, you want to testify to who God is in the world? I love what we did through Prosper the City. Um, I think it's important to be able to explain to people what Jesus did to, to be able to present the gospel. But Jesus himself says that the most powerful testimony we have to offer the world is our unity. And, and in a day like today, you can see why, because there's no unity anywhere. He's praying to his father, Jesus is. Near the end of his ministry, I want you to hear what he's praying for. He's praying for us to his father. He says, Father, I have given them all of us. I've given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one. I and them and you and me, so that they may be brought to complete unity. See, then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. Notice this, notice this. May they be brought to complete unity. Then the world will know. Unity, according to Jesus, is our testimony. That is our greatest witness. And you just look at this list here and you see the scriptural testimony of how important relationships are. They are not optional. They are absolutely essential for our growth. And yet, it's been a year. One thing after another. And it's easy to feel overwhelmed. And when we're overwhelmed, we want to give up hope or we want to pull back. We want to cocoon. We want to shut down. The last thing that we have the bandwidth or the margin for, the emotional energy for, are people who are causing us additional stress or pain. But in that moment, after being overwhelmed, before we make a decision, we have a critical choice to make. And people who grow through the difficulty, they make these two choices, the very same choices that Job made. First, they hold on to the promises of God even when they can't see any evidence of them. 
Again, that's what makes Job so remarkable. He lost everything, and yet he will not curse God. He will not speak against God. As Ryan put it, I still love it. I love his paraphrase. I love God. I know I do. I love him anyway. I can't explain this, but I love him, and I know he loves me. After all these chapters, all that Job went through, at the end of his story, he's still holding onto the promises of God, and God comes through. I want you to know God will come through. He will always come through on his promises for us. And if you ever doubt that, you just look again to the cross of Jesus. Because you know what you see when you look at the cross of Jesus? You see the very son of God suffering and dying and he's begging his father for mercy. He's begging his father to somehow let this cup pass from him. And I don't know about you, but I'm a dad and I love my kids. And it is so hard to watch your kids suffer, isn't it? And it's even harder to watch your kids suffer when you possess the power to eliminate their suffering. And yet, and maybe you know you, you shouldn't or you can't. Man, it is, it is hard to watch your kids suffer when you've got the power to eliminate their suffering and to still just let them suffer. I mean, that is, that is gut-wrenching stuff, isn't it? And so here's what I want you to remember when you doubt the promises of God, that Jesus, the Son of God, hung on a cross and he was crying out to his Father for mercy in anguish and pain and he was suffering so unjustly. And his Father chose to turn his face away to close his ear to the cries of Jesus. Because in Jesus dying, God was delivering on an ancient promise to all of us. He was keeping a promise to you. A promise made in the garden that one day evil will be destroyed. He was destroying evil. That one day our sin would be taken away. He was taking away your sin and your shame. He was keeping the promise to you that you would have relationship with God again. That you would be brought into into a, a new garden of life and community and wholeness again. He was keeping his promise to you and ignoring the cries of his son. He was delivering on that promise to you. Do you think there is any other promise in the world that he will fail to fulfill after seeing what he did on the cross with Jesus for you? And people who grow through struggle, they remember that and then they do something else They not only hold on to the promises of God, but they hold on to their relationships. So I don't know who you consider your tribe, your family, your circle, your community, your church, but I know one thing, you need them now more than ever. Because that's how you'll grow. Here's what I want us to do. Every year, uh, we pray a prayer in this service, a prayer of life change. We also do some other things usually in this service, but this year we're not doing them, you know, COVID and different kinds of restrictions. Um, But today, this is a personal moment for you as we pray this prayer. We don't gather here today to be spectators of how God's working in other people's lives, but we gather here today to open ourselves up to the work of God and to cry out to God and say, God, I'm so grateful you're at work in other people's lives, but God, I want you to be at work in my life. And that's what the words of this prayer are all about. So I'm gonna invite you to stand up right now, wherever you are, even those of you who are at home, I'm gonna invite you to stand up. Uh, And we did this a couple of weeks ago, I'm gonna invite you just to open up your hands like this as a sign that, man, when we come before God, we come empty handed. We don't have anything great to offer him. And we also don't have what it takes to solve our own problems, to fix our own situations to heal our own brokenness. We, 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 don't, we don't have anything to offer God or ourselves, but we also come with expectation. That's what this means, right? We come with expectation that God is a God who will supply, that he keeps his promises. And so today I want to invite you um, to pray this prayer with me. Also understanding that as we ask God to help us grow, as as we say, God, change me, grow me, form me, we're remembering that the way God will form us is through some of the people in our lives that right now we're having a really hard time with, so it's also a prayer of surrender, saying, God, help me persevere, not only in trusting your promises, but help me persevere in these relationships. Let's pray these words together now, and let these be your sincere hearts cry, we pray. Lord, 
as you carry out your work all over the world today, don't forget about me. Although I sometimes fight against your transforming hand in my life, don't give up on me. Save me from the prison of standing still, of stagnating, of being the same person today that I was yesterday. Make me new, for I believe you have all the power needed not only to change the world, but to change me. So change me, free me, forgive me, teach me, discipline me, stretch me, fill me and grow me so that you can more fully use me to bring your goodness to all who surround me. I humbly ask in Jesus' name, amen. I'm so glad you joined us today. If what you experienced in our worship just now was beneficial to you, then help us reach more people with this healing message of God's hope by spreading the word about who we are. You can like this video, which will help more people find it, or you can share it uh, on your social networks with uh, people that you think might benefit or be blessed from hearing these words today. Or even just simply subscribing to our channel helps us to show up in more people's feeds so that they can find us more easily. But either way, I hope that God moved powerfully in your life today. I pray that he gives you not just a good day, a good week, that he blesses you for this upcoming day. Have a great day.